Hey, it's Doug. Welcome to this Throwback Thursday episode. Going back to episode 79, which first published in January 2023, observing that it's okay to lie in some ways at some times. Um, I wanted to bring this episode back because I spoke with Emma Levine and Maurice Schweitzer uh, about the surprising reality of lying in a world where I mean, we're constantly focused on fighting misinformation and disinformation. I find it ironic to consider that sometimes it's actually okay to lie. So we explore the nuances of honesty and why in certain situations, at least bending the truth might be socially acceptable or even beneficial. Now, to some, a non-truth is a lie. It's a non-truth. And to others, that same lie is bending the truth. It depends on how we receive it. And that's probably why misinformation has always been around. It's everywhere we look. And it's probably always going to be around. This is a conversation that I think will have you rethinking the black and white view of truth and deception. In the 2009 rom-com, The Invention of Lying, life for Jennifer Garner and Ricky Gervais is an alternative reality world where lying doesn't exist. They're on a date at a restaurant, sitting together face to face when Garner's phone rings. Sorry, it's my mom. I, I think she's uh, probably checking on the date. It won't take long. Hello? Yes, I'm with him right now. No, not very attractive. No, it doesn't make much money. It's all right, though. Seems nice. Kind of funny. A bit fat. Has a funny little snub nose. Mm. Kind of like a frog in the facial. Yeah, but... No, I won't be sleeping with him tonight. Nope. Probably not even a kiss. Okay, you too. Bye. Sorry about that. It's all right. Don't think twice. How is your mom, all right? She's all right. Great. That's... The early parts of the movie create comedy in juxtaposition to the fact we tell lots of lies in everyday life. Sometimes we fib with the intention of not hurting someone or possibly making them feel better. But what about always tell the truth? Or is there a social benefit to some lies? Today on Stories and Strategies, the truth about lying. I My name is Doug Dow's music off the top for the movie The Invention of Lying, Catch the Wind by Donovan, the theme song. My guests this week are Emma Levine and Maurice Schweitzer. Hello to both of you. Hello, happy to be here. Hi. Emma, uh, you're joining us from Chicago. How are things in the Windy City? Uh, they're great. I'm looking out the window. The snow is falling. It is cold. Uh, typical winter in Chicago. As it should be, winters are cold and summers, my God, with the humidity, they are hot, hot, hot. Uh, Emma, you are an associate professor of behavioral science and the Charles E. Merrill faculty scholar at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. You have your PhD from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. Your research has been featured in top psychology, management, and marketing journals, including Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the Journal of Personality, and Social Psychology and Psychological Science. And Maurice, you are in Philadelphia today. How are things there? Uh, terrific. Uh, unseasonably warm, but sunny. <laughs> that will change. That, that will that change. That will change. Maurice, you are the Cecilia Yen Ku Professor of Operations, Information and Decisions and Management at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. You have a PhD in Operations and Information Management from the Wharton School and a BA in Economics. You've published over 100 articles on trust, negotiations and emotions, and you co-authored the book Friend and Foe, When to Cooperate, When to Compete, and how to succeed at both. That sounds like a good read, actually. It is. 
You're the director of the Wharton Behavioral Lab. And first things first with this episode, um, this is a series of scientific studies that you conducted. So because it's science, let's talk about the methodology that has to be first, just very quickly. How did you go about doing these studies? Sure. So, so these are laboratory studies. We conducted them in the lab using incentivized experiments. So uh, what that means is two anonymous strangers would kind of come into a space. They'd be paired with each other through a computer. Uh, one person, we'll call them the communicator, has the opportunity to lie to the other person, the target. And that lie either caused the target to win money or lose money. And so if it caused them to win money, we'd call that a pro-social lie, right? It helps the target earn more, do better. And so then we examine how much the target of that lie trusted the communicator based on the communicator's decision to lie or tell the truth. Uh, and, and we use a couple different paradigms in this lab to measure trust. So one measure uh, which measures benevolence-based trust is called the trust game. It uh, captures kind of a person's willingness to lend money to, or share money with another person, expecting someone to return it. And we also measured integrity-based trust, uh, which captures the target's willingness to rely on the communicator's words. And despite everything we talk about in society, that lying is bad, we tell our kids, don't lie, always tell the truth, honesty, the best policy, the reality, scientifically, is if it's a pro-social lie, you can lie to me, and I can know that you are lying to me while you're lying to me. If I receive that as of some form of personal benefit in some way, I'm okay with it. I'm not only okay with it, you just became my best friend. Well, I think that's right, Doug. I think what's so interesting is there, there's all this classical work presuming that deception's bad. And if you look at the statements, not only parents and teachers, but also corporations and their mission statements, they talk about the importance of honesty. And yet there are this there's a broad class of cases where we not only tolerate, but really endorse and certainly model lying. Uh, where I could say, you know, you know that, that talk was really interesting or, you know, thank you so much for asking that question. Uh, I love your haircut. That souffle was delicious. There's so many things that we might say that are polite but they're also, and, and a lot of Emma's work has really taken a deep dive into this, there are also some really important cases, like in medical domains, where deception is also uh, preferred. How do you mean? Well, some of my work has looked at this lately. I mean, you can think about the case of, of false hope in medicine, as Maurice alluded to. Uh, and, you know, there are circumstances, uh, both, you know, in the U.S., but certainly cross-culturally, where patients really value hope at the end of life, even false hope, right, to, to kind of live with dignity, to believe that things are going to be okay, even if the facts suggest otherwise. And this is a very specific but common form of pro-social law. Lying, uh, that people right, often endorse it. And in some of my work, I've found that patients actually want these types of lies more often than physicians are willing to offer them. I get that. What, one of the impetuses for doing this episode was a discussion I had with several colleagues about Santa Claus um, and, and the lie we tell our children involving Santa Claus, so to speak. What I'm getting from you is it's a good lie. If, if the kids are really into it and they, they enjoy it, we're good. I mean, I think, I think what's so interesting in this sort of this like broader puzzle is, is how we tell our kids never lie. You know, always tell me the truth. Don't lie to me. Honesty is always the right thing to do. And then we turn around and engage in deception and even model it. But then exhort them to, you know, tell grandma you love the sweater <laughs> and, you know, you know, don't, don't tell grandma she looks terrible. You can't say that. Um, we <laughs> were, we're modeling and endorsing deception. And I think, yeah, lying about Santa Claus is, is this 
fabrication that could yield really great benefits for, for people. But I'll also chime in and mention, right, that that part of what our research suggests is right, there are these two forms of trust, and there's also kind of this short-term consequence and long-term consequence. So, yes, I might love the, the revelry, the fantasy of Santa Claus. I might love your polite compliments. I might choose to be friends with you. I trust you to take care of me. That's all established in our work. But, but we also find that uh, even these pro-social lies that do have these short, uh, affiliative trust benefits do reduce trust in someone's words in the long run. And so it is important to be aware of that dynamic um, because, yeah, children might actually love Santa Claus, but then when they're told something later in life about uh, another myth, uh, they might right, doubt their parents' words. And we see that right in close relationships, in feedback, in a lot of settings. And so there are these dual benefits and costs uh, to even these pro-social lies. And I think what's, what Emma's saying is incredibly important. So I think the short-term and long-term effects are one distinction. Another distinction, as Emma was alluding to, is this idea of benevolence, so kindness, caring, warmth, uh, and pro-social lies do that. When I say your haircut looks terrific or that was a really interesting presentation or I loved your podcast, there's there, there could be warmth um, that we're demonstrating this, this benevolence. Um, and then this different dimension of trust, which is the integrity. Do I trust the honesty, veracity of, of your behavior? And... And pro-social lies are pushing things in these two different ways. Well, maybe the difference is if, if I tell you a lie and you know it's a lie, maybe we have that short term. OK, we're good. Longer term. I gotcha. I'm not necessarily going to trust everything you say. What about an altruistic lie where I lie to you and there's actually a cost to me? Can you give me an example of what that is where, where I take a hit? for telling the lie, but I do so for just for helping you. Yeah, so, so we mentioned kind of the medical domain, and here, you know, there's also circumstances in which people conceal their own illnesses, right? So imagine a parent, uh, you know, not revealing that they're ill to their child. It's actually really hard to battle that in. It's really hard not to be open. It would maybe be easier if they were, but, um, you know, they want to protect their child from this trauma. And so that's, you know, just, just one case. I'd say these altruistic lies still have the same dynamic, which you recognize the person's good intentions. You see them as, as moral. You see them as a good friend, as a good family member. But even those lies, right, you might wonder, the next time someone says you're okay, you know, they're okay, you just have that little seed of doubt of, is this true? Do I give the person credit for telling the altruistic lie when I realize that's what it is? Do I give them cred for that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we the credit we give them is this kindness, this warmth, this, they're looking out for my best interest. So we see people as kind and, and we want our friends to be kind. And in many cases, we want the kind friend over the honest friend. Uh, and kindness is so important. And that's, I think one of the key insights from our work is, is this importance of kindness. Um, and and where kindness is one important principle, honesty is another one. Often they go together, but sometimes they don't. Oh, I think what you're saying is if I'm being honest, but I'm being hurtful, there's a chance that the receiver does not see right. the benefit of that. Especially, yeah, especially in the short run. Right? There's an immediate hit uh, and you know, feeling of upset that comes with being hurt, even through the truth. Does what constitutes a pro-social lie, does it look the same across all cultures? Are we all the same? Well, yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. I, I, I know that pro-social lying transcends cultures and it's common and there are different expectations and different norms about what we say. Our investigation didn't look cross-culturally at this, um, but but I know 
just from linguistics and sort of the kinds of conversations we have in in Asian cultures and sort of, you know, what does a no mean and what is, you know, what can we say and, you know, the, the loss of face concerns that the pro-social lying is incredibly, incredibly common throughout the world. Are there different types of pro-social lies though? Can I, can I tell a pro-social lie one way here in North America as opposed to in Europe, as opposed to in Asia, as opposed to in, in Australia? Yeah, I, I think what uh, constitutes a pro-social lie and how people will react is culturally determined, right? So the reaction, this bump of warmth and kindness is driven by right the perception that this person was genuinely motivated to help me. And so if there's a norm that we're all candid towards each other and we give each other blunt truths, let's say, which is the case in, in, in Israel and other places, then a lie that kind of flouts that norm that would seem polite here might not be given credit there because we don't prize that type of politeness, we prize candor. And then we could see that move in the other direction in, in other cultures. Uh, Maurice uh, alluded to kind of East Asian cultures where there's norms of saving face. So their politeness, uh, especially across hierarchy, might be prized even more. And so uh, it would be seen as very appropriate, very moral, and very very well intended to tell certain pro-social lies of politeness. Yeah. In, in fact, actually, um, I have a study in, in uh, Southeast Asia where we looked in the medical domain. Um, these are, we, we looked at cancer patients with stage four cancer. So, so very advanced forms of cancer. And the vast majority of those patients didn't have a, a very accurate sense at all of their health status. Uh, many thought that they were on the road to recovery, and almost all of them were wildly optimistic about their lifespan. And, and by the time we finished the study, half of them had already died. See, and I would take that really negatively. I, I would see that as a bad habit. Is it, though? Or is it a good, is it a good thing? Well, there, that was, that was the norm. I mean, the family was complicit in the deception and they're just different norms. So I think, I think as, as Emma is sort of underscoring that what are the norms for candor? What are the norms for pro-social lies? And, and ideas about politeness are really wrapped up in this. So, so what is the polite thing to say? The, the whole concept of, of lying and I'm benefiting from it, you know, it's a pro-social lie. I can't help but think that there's there, this just adds to corruption. Specifically, politics come to mind. Um, I, I'm of the mind that, that conservative-minded voters, they want a con man. Whereas liberal-minded voters, they prefer a con artist. <laughs> Either, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, well... <laughs> I mean, I think I think what's 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 really interesting about politics is that we've we've come to expect a certain level of deception, and we we think the promises politicians make on the campaign trail um, should be taken with a grain of salt, and so we're. I mean, it's really unclear, and we see in George Santos this, you know, sort of. <laughs> you know, crossing the line or like, you know, like, where are we uh, in a post-truth world? And I think what's interesting is the, again, the, the sort of the norms and expectations. What, you know, are we playing poker here? Are we expecting people to bluff? Are there norms of deception that are within the rules that we're playing by? Um, and when have we crossed the line? And I think what's important is is for us to have a sense of we're playing the same game. So I understand when a politician promises to cut my taxes, they what that really means is that they'd like to cut taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think what's interesting that Maurice alluded to earlier, too, is, though, this this kind of double standard that we don't openly talk about this, right? So um, I have these new studies, which, which I really love, showing that actually in the domain of politics, 
we'd prefer politicians to say it's never okay to lie and take this really absolute stance and then go on and lie, be a blatant <laughs> hypocrite, then to admit that there's nuance, right? That there's nuance and sometimes you have to be flexible. Uh, and politicians also, this is a real sample of US uh, elected officials, they anticipate this. And so they know that in public, they're supposed to say you never lie, even if they go on to lie. Um, and so, right, there's there's this kind of open knowledge that this is part of politicking, but we aren't able to discuss right, what are the bounds of that because we don't discuss it openly. We are dishonest about dishonesty. Yeah, let me sort of build on that if I, if I could, Doug. What I'd say is the... I think the, the sort of the box that Em and I are, are opening is the idea that th there are these rules, these like social rules about lying, and we don't talk about them. We model them, we have expectations in our mind about them, but we don't teach our kids about them. Teachers don't teach students about them. And in corporations, we're not very clear with our employees about when it is and isn't okay to lie. And then in the politic sort of space, we have these norms and expectations and many people seem to get what the rules are, but because we're not explicit about it, we're going to see people cross the line, make mistakes, and we've created this ambiguous space around lying in a way that could be disambiguated. You know, back back to this initial question about, you know, the concept of lying, is it okay? Does it lead to corruption? I mean, I, you know, I, I do think there are all these rules, but I, I do want to reinforce that, right, even when you do it under the, the right rules and the right circumstances, deception, even the in the best cases, can still erode right this long-term trust in words. And so that is something we see happening in institutions. That is something we see happening in politics, in public health, in a lot of domains on a global sphere right now. And so, uh, you know, th th there there is a cost um, that we that we need to be aware of. I love this. Thank you both so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. This is great. If you'd like to send a message to my guests, Maurice Schweitzer and Emma Levine, we have their email addresses in the show notes. Stories and Strategies is a co-production of JGR Communications and Stories and Strategies podcasts. The pro-social thing for you to do is leave a rating on either Apple or Spotify for us. Five stars is very pro-social. We're best friends then. Thanks for listening. 